once again. So not till the last Happy New Year. We all have our own little personal traditions. Some of them are very personal in the sense that it's something that we do by ourselves. And I have a little personal tradition that I don't think I've really ever shared with anyone. Every Independence Day, I find a quiet place, open up my iPad or computer, and listen to the NPR recitation of the Declaration of Independence. You can get around some of the racism. <laughs> it's actually a remarkable piece of literature. And while it's memorable in many ways, it is most well-loved, of course, due to its immortal formulation of what Thomas Jefferson termed our unalienable rights. Rights which continue to define the ethos of the American dream, famously life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Today, I want to focus on the third part of this troika. What exactly is the pursuit of happiness? Or asked another way, what is happiness? What does it mean to pursue it? Turns out that happiness is quite a slippery idea to define. <coughs> Certainly one of life's more subjective ideas. After all, it's very personal. What makes me happy might not be what makes you happy. It's also quite elusive. The guarantee to pursue it, provided we can even define it, does not always mean we can achieve it or that we can sustain it. There are so many obstacles, some of them more difficult to overcome than others. Some of us suffer from depression. Others live in poverty or in the midst of war, so poor or helpless that the pursuit of happiness takes a back seat to the pursuit of food or clothing or basic shelter. But for those of us fortunate not to struggle daily with the attainment of life's most basic necessities, the pursuit of happiness usually means the pursuit of an emotional state, of contentment, of satisfaction. And it happens to be one of the most popular topics in our society these days. It's all over popular culture, whether it's Pharrell Williams imploring us in that wonderful song to clap our hands if happiness is the truth, whatever that means. <laughs> Or it's on the shelves of our local bookstores with such titles as The Happiness Project, The Happiness Mindset, 10% Happier, Hardwiring Happiness, The How of Happiness, Real Happiness, Authentic Happiness, just to name a few. But as it turns out, single-minded pursuit of the sort of happiness with which our society seems to be so obsessed may have a darker side. I first began to think about this a couple of years ago when I ran across a wonderful piece in the Atlantic Magazine by writer Emily Astani Smith. It was there that I was introduced to an important study published by researchers in the Journal of Positive Psychology. Positive psychology is an important branch of that field that rather than addressing mental illness, it focuses upon issues of personal growth. So the study in question was conducted by Florida State University Professor Roy Baumeister, and it detailed a wide-scale survey of Americans in which he and his researchers attempted to isolate the predictors of real happiness. Specifically, they sought to understand the relationship between happiness, conceived of as personal contentment and satisfaction, and the pursuit of a life of meaning. What they discovered is that while Sometimes there exists an overlap. It's not always the case. For some people, enough for this to be quite statistically significant, meaningful lives are not always the happiest ones. And happier and more content lives are not always that meaningful. Now, none of this was meant to indicate that contentment always comes at the expense of meaning. But the single-minded pursuit of this kind of happiness something that is such a dominant feature of modern American life, is correlated with some very undesirable characteristics. In the words of the researchers themselves, experiencing happiness without meaning characterizes a relatively shallow, self-absorbed, or even selfish life, in which things go well, and desires are easily satisfied, and difficult or taxing entanglements. Are avoided. 
They described people who placed the highest value on personal happiness of this sort as takers. And those who place a higher value on living a life of meaning, they called givers. And while there was no evidence that living a life of satisfaction and contentment precluded living a life of meaning, there was extensive evidence that for many people, the pursuit of a meaningful life frequently entails sacrificing some comfort and some ease. Of course, our challenge is that people want it both ways. Everyone wants to be happy. Everybody wants meaning in life. It's not always impossible, of course. There's an overlap, and it's, it's not insignificant. But happiness, as we commonly understand it, in terms of pleasure, of contentment, of ease, is distinct from meaning. And the two are not always compatible. Which means that, like everything else in life, we have to make uncomfortable choices. One of these choices can sometimes be whether to live meaningfully or whether to live happily. Because we can't always have both, and sometimes we must forsake one in favor of the other. But it is how and what we choose that says volumes about what kind of people we want to be. First, it's important to understand that seeking happiness is a legacy of our evolution. Our ancestors, not just our primate ancestors, but going all the way back to the first vertebrates, had certain basic needs, just like we do. They had hunger, thirst, fear, they experienced anxieties. They craved the things that could solve those wants and lacks in their existence. As social creatures, primates, that's us and our ape and monkey cousins, well, we also sought social solutions, ways that we could make each other happy, like personal intimacy, for example, sometimes chemical solutions like alcohol or drugs. The collective satisfaction of our physical and social needs help us, helps us to achieve these states that we usually call pleasure, contentment, satisfaction, all under the rubric of happiness. And as our civilizations and technologies have advanced, we've actually created more and more new needs to be fulfilled, no longer made happy by basic food, drink, shelter, intimacy. Our needs came to include really good food, very high quality homes, lots of distractions and entertainment, consumer goods like the cars, clothes, art, and other new dads and whatchamacallits that we've come to view as necessities. The more of these things that we have, the happier we tend to feel. This is all very human and very normal. No one should feel bad about having nice things. But while satisfying the hunger for contented happiness with nice things may be part of what makes us uniquely human, it is not the best part of our humanity. If, as humanists, we choose to celebrate the part, the best, of, uh, the best part of those distinct powers and qualities that distinguish us from our fellow animals. Then it is for us to seek something that is more significant than just a souped-up version of the quest for the tastiest antelope that our ancestors sought. <coughs> I suggest that the best part of humanness is that part of it which allows us to experience meaning. And it is a known fact that no other animal in the world pursues meaning in life. To experience contentment is, as we've seen, a legacy of our earliest beginnings. I can go all the way back to uh, it is amoebas. But to experience meaning, that means to ex exercise the wonderful and uniquely human capability of linking events across time to integrate our past, present, and future. For while happiness merely requires the ability to feel good, meaning demands the ability to reflect, to consider, to judge. It starts with altruism. This is a necessary but not sufficient ingredient in the pursuit of happiness. We also enjoy the capacity to behave altruistically as a result of evolution. 
In his book, The Selfish Gene, Richard Dawkins illustrated how altruistic behaviors can confer a survival benefit, even when they might result in the death of an individual organism. Self-sacrifice can facilitate the survival of genes. But it is only when combined with the incredible, an incredibly unique human capability of integrating and interpreting the experiences of the past, the opportunities of the present, and the possibilities of the future in an effort to collectively assign them a grand and overarching meaning that we comprehend what it means to be truly human. Perhaps a small illustration will help us to better understand this. Three of the happiest and most content creatures with whom I share this planet are my cats. <laughs> They frequently cuddle up to me, sit on my lap or beside me, and when they do, they purr. I'm told that this is at least in part an expression of their contentment, their well-being, their satisfaction, a sign that they feel secure, happy. My cats, however, display a not surprising inability to reflect upon how the experience has <laughs> and to any of their other experiences, not past, not present, not future. This is a capacity that we alone possess. And when we are at our best, we choose not a life of purring, but a life of meaning. For so many reasons, this is the right choice. One of these comes to us when we recognize the elusiveness, the tenuous and fleeting nature of the cat type or the dog type of happiness. Having no ability to reflect, my cats are blissfully unaware that they are lucky cats. <laughs> they are unaware that other cats don't have it so good. <laughs> and they are blissfully unaware that one day it's all going to end. But we are. We know that loss is real. That death is a fact. That at some point in our lives we are all going to suffer and we are all going to mourn. If my cats knew this, would they sacrifice some of their happiness in order to pursue meaning? Knowing cats, I doubt it. <laughs> Being human, I am convinced that this is completely possible for us. Parenthood, though not a completely universal experience, is widespread enough that it serves as an excellent example. Humans are also unique among all earthly creatures in our years and years and years long commitment to parenting. <laughs> but when we really give it some thought, it might be hard to come up with a better example of something that brings us meaning at the expense of happiness. Which is not to say that being a parent is not a joyous experience. The births of my daughters were the happiest moments of my life. In fact, I cannot remember anything more profoundly joyful than the first time that I held my firstborn. I cried tears of happiness. I felt such contentment, pure bliss. But then I was invited by the delivery room people to follow them, my newborn infant in arms, down the hall where, they told me, they would perform something called the Guthrie test. Okie dokie, I thought, let's go do the Guthrie test. And though I was carrying precious cargo, I practically skipped a stride and I'm bursting with delight. And then I found out what the Guthrie test is. Many of you may know what I'm talking about. The lab assistant took out a little needle and pricked my baby's heel, and a rapidly growing pool of blood emerged, followed by my little Eliza Baraka crying, wailing, shrieking. And I was not happy. I was in pain. And my tears were not of happiness. And that was my introduction to parenthood. <laughs> so I don't care how much happiness we claim that our children give us, and they do, they also give us no end of pain, anxiety, and worry. There is no greater sacrifice and investment that we make than we do in the lives of our children. Even people who do not have children frequently create relationships in loco parentis, surrogate parents, because humans crave this level of meaning in our lives. But happiness, a little, and some of the time, a lot. The 
but there is not a parent among us who would claim that we decided to become parents because of the happy, happy, fun times that lay ahead of us. <laughs> Hearing our children cry, watching them deal with failure or disappointment, experience anxieties about their future. These are not happy, happy, fun times. Isn't it odd, then, that when we are asked by others what we want for our children, we frequently say that all we want is for them to be happy? Maybe after this morning we might rethink that wish. Maybe what we should be hoping for our children is that they live lives of meaning. Earlier I spoke of the transitory nature of happiness, its fleeting and tenuous nature. If any group of people can understand this, it should be the Jews. Having suffered the worst that the world can throw at us, we have emerged when we are at our very best, as a people that prioritizes meaning over happiness. In the words of Woody Allen, the Jews have learned that life is full of misery, loneliness, and suffering, and it's all over much too soon. <laughs> As it turns out, our happiness researchers discovered something else very important about the people who place the highest value on the pursuit of meaningfulness. They are the ones who are best able to make sense out of the course of their lives. This, as we've learned, is due to our unique human ability to truly reflect and integrate all of our experiences. If one's goal is happiness above all, it's very unlikely to spend a lot of time thinking about the past or the future. This kind of in-the-momentness made popular by Buddhism and other Eastern philosophies has its merits in terms of stress reduction, allowing people the possibility to put things in perspective. But true perspective does not come from living only in the moment. It requires the ability to look honestly at our past, our current condition, and the implications of what these are for our future. And when we are able to do so, we not only arrive at a sense of better perspective about the course of our lives, we also acquire a much healthier picture of ourselves. The positive psychologists in our happiness study ask subjects about a whole slew of different kinds of activities that people engage in every day. The list included everything from reading and watching TV to exercising to taking care of kids, worrying about things, listening to other people talk about their interests and problems, buying gifts for oneself or others, and to an amazing degree, all of the acts that created the least amount of happiness were also considered the most meaningful. And you probably already guessed that taking care of kids topped the list of least happy-making, most meaning-making activities. <laughs> Worrying, giving gifts to others as opposed to buying things for ourselves, performing the most non-happy making household chores, they rank high in meaningfulness. Even experiencing great stress at work, depending of course on one's work, definitely one of the least happiness oriented parts of our lives was highly co correlated with happiness, with a being Many of you, at some point or another during my presentation, have probably had the same thought that I've had. Can't a meaningful life somehow be understood as a life of happiness? Well, this takes us to a central philosophical question. You know I was going to speak in some philosophy here somewhere. Maybe it would help if we changed the way we think about the entire subject of happiness versus meaningfulness. Because sometimes the way that we think about things is very important. Semantics are not always just a matter of rhetoric. Is it possible that we never really understood what the heck Thomas Jefferson was talking about when he penned that pantheon of rights with its devotion to a guarantee of the pursuit of happiness? It's not just possible. It's quite likely that he was not talking about happiness the way that modern America has come to think of it. How do we know this? Well, for one thing, Jefferson took the idea from the teachings of the 4th century BCE Greek philosopher Epicurus. Some of you who have studied with me know that humanist Jews are big fans of his. He provides the basis for a lot of our thinking. 
Not many of his own writings are in our possession, but much of his philosophy has come down to us in large part through a famous work called On the Nature of Things. I spoke about it a few weeks ago, a book that was written concerning it. This book, On the Nature of Things, was written hundreds of years later by a Roman thinker, one Lucretius, who identified the pursuit of happiness as one of the central principles of Epicurean thought. And Thomas Jefferson owned no fewer than eight copies of this book. So it's a fair assumption that he was basing himself on these thinkers. And while Epicurean thought is mistakenly believed to be about pleasure, it could not be further from the truth. Epicurus and Lucretius never intended to, pro to promote that form of happiness which is enjoyed by our pets. They were not urging the pursuit of emotional contentment or even joy. What they were recommending was the pursuit of that state wherein a person abstains from unnecessary desires to the extent possible and seeks thereby to achieve inner tranquility. <coughs> For Epicurus, the highest degree of happiness was the pursuit of philosophical knowledge. I can't imagine too many of us would share that idea of happiness with him. But for Epicurus, studying philosophy meant exploring meaning. So he experienced this as the epitome of happiness. Epicurus's and Jefferson's distinctive equivalence of meaning with happiness might be of some service to us. Aristotle also had something to say on the matter. He too understood happiness in a more expansive way. He said it's not a state of being, it's an activity, specifically the act of living well. Aristotle believed that true happiness is located in our ability to exercise that which is most excellent about us. Not in the pursuit of pleasure, which for Aristotle, like Epicurus, was no form of happiness at all, but by thriving in our unique human abilities. Semantics do matter. Our very definition of happiness can be reinterpreted. We can be better people by contributing the best of ourselves, our excellences, to others. And though there are no guarantees, we might even enjoy some contentment from this, just as we do from our children. Not always, but sometimes, and deeply. For as Aristotle said, just as your eyes do not pain you when you can see well, so your life can be less painful when you are living it well. Finally, no discussion of life's meaning would be complete without devoting at least some part of it to the work of that master of the life of meaning, Dr. Viktor Frankl. For those of you unfamiliar with this great man who held both an MD and PhD and one of, was one of the world's leading psychiatrists and neurologists, allow me just a few moments to share some of his biography. Dr. Frankl was born in Vienna in 1905. When Europe began to disintegrate for the second time, Dr. Frankl was just beginning to acquire an international reputation in his field. Because of this, in 1941, he was able to obtain a visa to come with his wife to America. But this would have meant leaving behind his parents at a time when the Nazis were beginning to round up Austrian Jews, beginning with the elderly. So he did not take the offer. He did not come to America. Due to his prominence, his family was taken to the so-called model camp, Theresienstadt. There, he served as a physician and counselor to hundreds of other inmates. Ultimately, he was transferred to Dachau. His wife was killed. His parents were killed. But he survived. And when he emerged from that hell, he turned his experiences into a book that would once again bring him to the world's attention. Man's Quest for Meaning. It is considered one of the most influential books of modern times, never out of print. There were, of course, many reasons that one person survived the nightmare of the Holocaust while another did not. Many of these factors were well beyond any individual's control. But according to Frankel, people who were in a position to survive did so for a very specific reason. They were able to comprehend 
that while the Nazis could take every material happiness away from them, they could not rob them of their life's ultimate meaning. Even while in Dachau, working as a slave laborer, Frankel conducted group therapy sessions with suicidal and despairing fellow inmates. And in so doing, he discovered something very important about both joy and meaning. He found, just as we've learned, that meaning is determined by the human capability to reflect. Specifically, Frankel emphasized the significance of, an abil of human's ability to create a frame of reference in which to interpret their experiences and expectations. This was a remarkable insight. It revealed that even joy and suffering are relative to a person's circumstances. That people have the ability to choose what will become of them, mentally and spiritually. And this led him to believe that even in the worst, the very, very worst of circumstances, people can make a choice to live a meaningful life. In the absence of any kind of contented happiness, how could there be any in Dachau? There were those who were able to see a future for themselves and to interpret their experiences of suffering on a wider and broader canvas. Those who could not do so, he observed, tended to lose all hope. He wrote, Man is responsible and must actualize the potential meaning of his life. Being human always points and is directed to something or someone other than oneself, be it a meaning to fulfill or another human being to encounter. The more one forgets himself by giving himself to a cause to serve or another person to love, the more human he is and the more he actualizes himself. In other words, to be a giver, to pursue meaningfulness, is the most precious human power of all. In today's world, pursuing happiness has taken on such great dominance, and happiness is a good thing. We all want it, and it's a basic biological need. But as we've seen, it's not what makes us uniquely human. That is enabled by our ability to reflect upon past, present, and future to see how the pieces have come together in ways that help others, that allow us to exercise our excellences, to, in Frankel's words, give ourselves a cause to serve, a person to love, some purpose that is higher than ourselves. Which brings me to one last reflection. Our ability to think, upon, think about our past, present, and future includes a future that none of us like to dwell upon, the one after our own deaths. Such reflection has led many people to believe that our future doesn't end with death. Secular humanists do not believe this. We know that death is the end of our personal experience. But there is a sequel. We do live on in the lives of those we leave behind. I've always imagined my sequel by asking myself this. Do I want my children, my family, my friends, or my community to remember me for the contentment I experienced? I hope that I'm contented enough that this will be a fond memory for them. But what I really want, what I hope that all of us want, is that this will be the legacy that we bequeath to those we leave behind. That we try to leave the world a better place than we found it that we touch the lives of others, improving the quality of their time on Earth, that we offered solace to those who suffered, that we sacrificed for the sake of those whom we love, for the, that we sacrificed even for the sake of those whom we did not love, and that when all was said and done, we truly lived a life of meaning. I wish all of you a happy and me.
little bit of a humanistic benediction for ourselves. At the close of this day's contemplation, we declare, let the year upon which we enter be for us, our family, our community, and for all the world, a year of blessing and prosperity, a year of security and comfort, a year of health and contentment, a year of joy and celebration, a year of virtue and justice, a year that finds the hearts of parents united with the hearts of their children, a year of pardon and forgiveness, a year of peace, a year of love.